Good morning. You know, when we look at the book of Psalms, it is really, it's somewhat of a challenge to not find one that doesn't either start or end with praise. Or it's just throughout the entire psalm. And sometimes, I don't know about you, but that isn't natural for me. I get caught up in life. And sometimes it gets a bit challenging. But every time the psalmist encountered one of those challenging things, he finishes up with something about the Lord being his rock, his deliverer, his refuge, his salvation. And it goes on and on and on. So this morning, we are going to start off, if you can't praise the Lord with this first song, um, we'll arrange a meeting with you and Pastor or Christopher afterwards and see if we can't... Me? (laughs) I I was just delegating. (laughs) We'll see if we can't straighten a few things out. Let's stand together and praise the Lord together.
words in this song that made people praise you. That's why we're here today, Father, and we just thank you for what you've done for us. And uh, as we think of that, Father, we thank you for your grace and mercies that you've provided for us, even this week and the things that have happened to us. And we just thank you for the way you take care of us. Father, we also thank you for your word, and we thank you for the faithfulness of our pastors and our teachers to uh, study it each week and to bring it to us. And Father, as we think about that, we're reminded in 2 Timothy about what the word does, and gives us corrections and trains us and that we might be able to be trained in righteousness. And we just thank you for, for that as well. And then Father, we also thank you for the sacrifice that Jesus made, that we are able to have forgiveness of sin, be able to have eternal life and fellowship with you. And Lord, we certainly pray today that if there be one here that doesn't know you as personal Lord and Savior, that today that they would accept Jesus as their Savior. And so, Father, we just thank you for again for the opportunity as we come together as your church that we're able to honor you in, in spirit and in the truth. In your name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning. Good morning. What a joy to gather and worship as a family. Amen? Amen? It's been a beautiful morning already. We want to welcome you here this morning. If this is your first time with us at McCoy Memorial Baptist Church, we're thankful that you are worshiping with us. If this is your first time in the pew in front of you, should be a guest card. If you could pull that out, fill it out for us. In a few moments, we're going to take an offering. If you could place that in the offering plate for us, that'd be your gift to us this morning. We want to know you by name and know that you're here. We're grateful you've joined us for worship. Also, if this is your first time as you leave this sanctuary, that we have a, a welcome table in the foyer on the left. Stop by. We have a gift for you. We've got information for you. We've got a, a handsome young man there, Manning, of course, this morning. And uh, he'd love to meet you and give you information about our ministries here. One announcement that I have tonight, connection groups start this evening. If you're not a part of those and you're interested in being a part of them, let me know. I'd love to try to connect you with the group that would work for you. That's all I have, Pastor. Good morning. Good, morning. Good to see each and every one this morning. Man, when I came out early this morning to go over the, to the office, the birds were chirping. And I mean, I mean a lot of them. And that's a good sign. And uh, this sunshine is good to see. It's just a great day to be together, not only for the weather, but for to be with God's people. And so looking forward to a wonderful morning together. Uh, I just have a few things I need to share with you. First of all, let me give you an update on Judy Guest. Judy, uh, as I think many of you know this already because she says she's, they've received a lot of calls. Judy had surgery early in the week, and uh, she did not get home until Thursday from the hospital. They wanted to keep her, do a little physical therapy with her, but she is now, uh, I know she met with people on Friday, a therapist to begin her therapy, and she's doing very well. She's got a daughter and son-in-law that live right down the road from her, and they have been super helpful to them, and uh, they're very thankful. So thanks for your prayers. She appreciates them a lot. And this morning, it's good to have one of our missionary couples with us this morning, Paul and Kim Halsey. I didn't see where they, where they sit. Oh, there they are. Paul and Kim, good to have you with us today. And uh, they serve under the agency Cross World. And they're down at Liberty University amongst thousands of students that God is working in their lives, various ones, and they're, they're trying to find their way and the call of God in their life. And Paul and Kim are there to help them to the various steps, to the next step, to the next step, to guide them into full-time career service for the Lord in various places of the world. So thanks for your ministry over the years, Paul. And it's good to see you and Kim uh, this morning. Uh, the other one I want to make is, uh, oh yeah, uh, Friends of Israel, I mentioned this a couple of weeks ago, but one more time, Friends of Israel is having a one-day conference. It's a prophecy conference on February the 18th. That's a Saturday. It goes from 9 a.m. to 3. It's in Kalamazoo at the Northeastern Baptist Church in Kalamazoo. And uh, the theme is the temple, 
God's home on earth revealed in prophecy and practice. Discover the significance of the four temples, past, present, and future. And it's going to be a great conference. There's several of us that are going. And if you'd like to go, it's easy to register. It's only $15, and that includes lunch. So that's not bad at all. So it's up in Kalamazoo, and um, that's Saturday. There'll be plenty of time to get there. So if you're interested, you can sign up. I've got more information. I can get it to you. So see me, call me, email me, whatever you'd like to do. And I'll see that you get in on that. I'd like to ask the ushers if they would come at this time, please. Now, as they're coming, this is our Missionary of the Month Sunday. And I, uh, I am in charge of all the missions committee members have particular missionaries that they're to communicate with, with and stay in contact with. One of mine is Ernie and Carol Taylor and Matt and Cheryl Storer with Child Development International. They prepared for us a uh, three minute, three and a half minute uh, video, an update, but let me give you what he sent me on Friday, just yes, two days ago. Our team is almost ready to leave for India and Vietnam. Matt, his son-in-law, Zach, Matt's son, and I, the three of them, leave on February 19th, and we are excited for the opportunity to minister to a group of local village pastors in each country. Now, we need your prayers as we complete our teaching assignments. Also, Will you pray for us, for those pastors who will attend, that their hearts and minds will be open to new ideas for their ministries? Asia is a changing place, and in order to reach villagers in their com communities, these pastors need new ideas, a new zeal for God, and a new excitement for ministry. They live in remote areas where there are few other Christians. They face opposition and, in many places, real persecution. Please pray that God will bless them. Okay, so let's look to the Lord. The, we'll begin to take the offering and then start the video right when we're, we're right at the beginning here. Let's pray. Our Father, thank you so very much for our Ernie and Carol, for Matt and Cheryl, and the ministry they have developed in India, in Cambodia, in Vietnam, in Nepal, uh, in, these, in Myanmar, these various places, to train pastors that go out in very remote places and they evangelize, they share and preach the gospel. That's what they do. Some of these countries are under great stress and strain from persecution, Myanmar in particular, and Vietnam. And uh, we just pray for this group that is going for their teaching opportunities, that many pastors will come, that they will uh, be able to get there through all the various means they do to get there. We pray that it will be a successful time and that they, all these pastors will use the training to help their ministries and to advance the work of the gospel in those countries. We're thankful now that we can honor you in our tithes and offerings this morning. And it is important we give you praise for the privilege and opportunity to do that. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Well, I'm still celebrating Christmas. I don't know about you. Yeah, that's right. But praise to the Lord Almighty and thanks to your prayers and generosity. The good news of Jesus went out to over 6,000 people in December. One of the countries where we work in Vietnam, there were 319 people who perfects accepting Jesus as Savior. My wife Cheryl and I also want to thank you for praying over our pastor network in the country of Myanmar. Now more than ever, prayer and resources are needed. Our friends there continue to face extreme circumstances as a result of the military coup, which is a war happening right now. And it started about two years ago, this very month. Well, your brothers and sisters in Christ are struggling to afford food, have a lack of freedom moving from place to place. They're living in daily fear of imprisonment for leading people to Jesus. There's so much happening. But you know, the Lord saw this coming. He prepared us in advance. Five years ago, the Lord called Ernie and 
you to go to Myanmar and begin training these wonderful people, training them how to connect with non-believers, people of Orthodox Buddhism, challenging them to go out and love well first, and through that love, relationship is born and matures into trust. And that's when both closed, hard hearts really want to accept the gospel and know the truth. So now, rather than sitting back in the safety of their home through the amazing love of our Lord, these Christian workers are emboldened because of our training. They're emboldened because of your prayers and the resources that are going to them every month. They've helped over 18,000 displaced people with food and shelter and clothing. They've fed over 5,000 who are struggling to eat, provided clean water pumps for 3,000 plus people. Financially providing for 371 pastors who are extremely destitute due to the fact that the churches have been shut down for nearly two years. You know, there's more to be done, and we definitely need your prayers. I ask that you pray for our key leader on the ground in Myanmar. His name is Jimmy. I ask that you pray for good health and safety for him and his family as he goes about mobilizing this pastor network. I pray. I ask you to pray for wisdom and favor of the government, the military, the police, the community leaders. And finally, please pray for the upcoming pastor training conferences that he will be leading in the months to come. I have one more prayer request not related to the Myanmar ministry. Please pray for Ernie, my son in law Zach, and I. As the Lord is sending us to India and Vietnam, February 20th to March 8th, our mission will be to train pastors on evangelism techniques, encourage them to go out into the world and share the gospel, and uplift them with the word of God. Please pray for the logistics of such a trip. We'll be on 10 different flights. You can believe it. Please pray that in sickness like COVID, for favor with government officials, and that the Lord will have exactly those who he wants at our training conferences. And finally, please pray that as a result of this effort, the Lord's kingdom will grow in depth and in numbers. Now, I leave you with a passage that means so much to my heart, Romans 15, 20 through 21. It has always been my ambition to preach the gospel where Christ was not known, so that I would not be building on someone else's foundation. Rather, as it is written, those who are not told about him will see, and those who have not heard will understand. Now, grace to all who love the Lord Jesus Christ with an undying love. God bless. Please stand here. We will continue singing to you.
Praise the Lord. My soul. I will praise the Lord all my life. I will sing praise to my God as long as I live. Do not put your trust in princes, in human beings who cannot save. When their spirit departs, they return to the ground. On that very day, their plans come to nothing. Blessed are those whose help is the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord their God. He is the maker of heaven and earth, the sea, and everything in them. He remains faithful forever. He upholds the cause of the oppressed and gives food to the hungry. The Lord sets prisoners free. The Lord gives sight to the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord watches over the foreigner and sustains the fatherless and the widow. But he frustrates the ways of the wicked. The Lord reigns forever. Your God, O Zion, for all generations. Praise the Lord.
This morning, Father, we thank you that your mercy, your grace, your provision is more than anything we could ever encounter. The riches, the resources that you possess are so far greater than anything we can imagine. Help us to remember that. Help us when facing challenging situations, when things come along that should discourage us. Yes, we may struggle. We may have to kind of feel our way along a while and lean completely on you, but help us always to remember your mercy, your willingness to pour out on us so much more than we deserve is more than all of that. Encourage us with that thought this morning. It's in your name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. How's that? Oh, that's, that's good. That's good. Okay. Controversy has always surrounded the person of Jesus. The biblical Jesus is a man of controversy. And folks, why should we be surprised? I mean... We do know what the Lord said, don't we? In the Gospels, Jesus said this. Matthew chapter 10. Do not suppose that I have come to bring peace to the earth. And you say, oh, oh I thought that's why he came. Well, we could get into that. That's an eschatological matter or as far as prophecy is concerned. But do not suppose that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I did not come to bring peace but a sword. For I have come to turn a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, a man's enemies will be the members of his own household. I mean, Jesus causes controversy. Here's a family going along their merry way and doing the things people do on this planet, whatever it is in family life on this earth, and all of a sudden, one of them meets the Lord. And all of a sudden now, there's conflict as... The believer is seeking to grow and loves Jesus and wants to be with God's people. And there's issues and there's conflict. Happens all the time. And then the Lord went on to say this after he said that. He said, anyone who loves his father or mo mother more than me is not worthy of me. You see, family is not first. I didn't get an amen on that. God is first. If you love your father or mother more than me, Jesus said, you're not worthy of me. Anyone who loves his son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And anyone who does not take his cross, self-denial, dying to self, take his cross and follow me, in surrender to the Lord Jesus as the Lord who is the Lord of our life and has saved us and called us out. Does not, is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life, what does that mean? Whoever, whoever goes after life, you know, all the gusto you can get or to take in as much as this world. It's my life. I only have one to get, one to get everything I can, and I'm going to use it to be the best I can and to accumulate what I can. 
I'm going to enjoy my life. Anyone who finds his life is going to lose it. And whoever loses his life, for my sake, and Mark's gospel says, for, the, for my sake and for the sake of the gospel, will find it. Why should we be surprised that the biblical Jesus is a man of controversy? Well, without a doubt, Jesus Christ was and is and has always been the most controversial figure in history. Controversy is a major theme of John's gospel. It is a major theme of this gospel that the apostle himself, he was called the one whom Jesus loved. And perhaps the closest human being to the Lord Jesus Christ on this earth that ever was, as far as his earthly ministry is concerned. It's a major theme of John's gospel. And here's an outline of the gospel of John, the three major sections. I didn't include on the slide the prologue, which is the first 18 verses, which are awesome. And I didn't include the epilogue, which is chapter 21, which follows the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, which is also the chapter 21. Awesome! But here are the three major portions of John's gospel. First of all, in the first 12, from chapter 1, verse 19, through the, through the end of chapter 12, Jesus manifests himself to the people of Israel, to the nation of Israel. He came as their Messiah, what the prophets had predicted. Jesus manifested himself to the nation. And in, those 12, and in these 12 chapters, there's movement. The, first of all, there's the period of consideration, chapters 1 through 4, where Jesus presents himself, his claims, through his miracles, his talks, his discourses. Public and private to Nicodemus and the woman at the well. He presents his claims. Then we went in chapters 5 and 6 into the period of controversy. Two great miracles. The healing of the invalid at the pool of Bethesda. And the, the conversation that went on from that. And then the feeding of the 5,000. And the discourse and dialogue that went on from that. The period of controversy. You see, it was inevitable that such claims and demands as his should meet opposition. Chapters 5 and 6 show the development of this opposition in debate and controversy before it broke into conflict. And beginning in chapter 7 through almost the end of chapter 11, we have the period of conflict. The period of conflict. Very important time. And what's important about it is this period of conflict is the longest single section in the fourth gospel. It is, by the number of words, the longest single section in the gospel of John. It describes the parallel development. Parallel development of belief and unbelief among the hearers of Jesus and the resultant clash of these two opposing forces, belief and unbelief. The difference between the period of conflict and the period of controversy, the difference between those two is that the period of controversy narrates mostly Argument arising from unsettled attitudes. Trying to figure this out. Debate going on. But unsettled attitudes. While the period of conflict represents fixed attitudes. Fixed at war. Decisions have been made. Fixed attitudes at war with one another. The opening verse of chapter 7. Look at it. After this. Jesus went around in Galilee, purposely staying away from Judea because the Jews there were waiting to take his life. 
It said here that Jesus continued to walk. He continued to move about in Galilee. By the way, he hadn't been in Jerusalem for a year and a half at this point. He was, it was his Galilean ministry for a whole year and a half, 18 months. He had not gone back to Jerusalem since chapter 5, verse 1. He continued to be there because the Jews were seeking to kill him. It was no longer a debate among them as to what should be done about Jesus. They concluded he must be killed. And from this point to the crisis at the close of chapter 11, Jesus was living on borrowed time as far as his enemies were concerned. To them, it was a matter of catching him in some unguarded moment. To him, it was the destiny appointed by the Father. He always did the will of the Father on his timetable, too. Now, this, this period, this period of conflict, actually began with the Feast of Tabernacles. We're going to see that when we read the passage. The Feast of Tabernacles. That was going on in Jerusalem. And then the end of this section, the period of conflict, chapter 11 at the, at the end, we are now at the final Passover. By the way, the Feast of Tabernacles took place in the fall. That was a fall feast. And then this period of conflict ends with Jesus' last Passover the, at which he met with his disciples. He had his trials. He was crucified. Basically, from the end of chapter 11 through the end of the Gospel of John, we're dealing with the last week of Jesus' life. So about the period of conflict here is about a six-month period. From the fall of A.D. 29 to the spring of A.D. 30. It's heating up, heating up, and we're going to see that as we move through this passage. All right, I'd like to, if you're not there already, please open your Bibles this morning to John chapter 7. And um, the setting of this chapter is the Feast of Tabernacles. Let me say a little bit about this Feast of Tabernacles. It was a week-long festival lasted a whole seven days, and it took place in the fall. The festival commemorated God's goodness to the Jewish people during their desert wanderings after the exodus from Egypt. The four decades that would follow as they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years before they entered the promised land, and it was due to their unbelief. But they stayed for four decades wandering, and so during the Feast of Tabernacles, they remembered that. They commemorated God's goodness to them. They built leafy branches, uh, leafy temporary shelters. They built them on their rooftops because their rooftops were flat. They built them along the road. They lived in, in them throughout the week to commemorate how they had lived for 40 years after the Exodus in tents and how God protected and provided for them. Jerusalem was packed along the roads everywhere. People came. It was one of those required things to come to. There were three of them, major ones. And Tabernacles was one. And people were everywhere living in these leafy, temporary dwellings to commemorate the time in their history. The festival, by the way, was also called the Feast of Ingathering. Not only the Feast of Tabernacles, but the Feast of Ingathering because they also celebrated the completion of the harvest. So, in other words, the Feast of Tabernacles or the Feast of Ingathering commemorated the journey from Egypt to Canaan and celebrated the productivity, the harvest, the productivity of the land of milk and honey, the land of Canaan that God gave, they gave to them. By the way, let me just continue to say Tabernacles was a festive time for the people. The temple area was, was lighted, was illuminated by large, and I mean large, huge candlesticks, candelabra-type things. Reminding the people that during the wilderness, how did God guide them at night? 
by a pillar of fire coming out of the holy, holy of holies. He guided them out of the ark. And so in the, in the temple grounds, on the temple mount, in the various courts, there were these huge candlesticks. And each day, the priests would carry water. They'd go down to the pool of Siloam, and they'd go down with, with these pitchers and come out, come back up, and they would pour it out. They would pour the water out in a ceremonial type thing, reminding the Jews of the miraculous provision of water from the rock. The water from the rock. Now the feast may have been a jubilant time for the Jews, for the nation of Israel, but it was a difficult time for Jesus. For it marked the beginning of open and militant opposition to him and his ministry, which would end in the period of crisis and his trials and his crucifixion. So keep that in mind. Now, as we go through this, I want to say that chapter 7 has three time divisions all centered around the Feast of Tabernacles. And I'm going to kind of build my messages around these three time divisions. The first time division is found in verse 1, where it says the Feast of Tabernacles. After this, Jesus went around, then verse 2, when the Jewish Feast of Tabernacles was near... So we have before the Feast of Tabernacles our text this morning, basically verses 1 through 9. Then we have in the midst of the week, in the middle of the week, look at verse 14. Not until halfway through the feast did Jesus go up to the temple courts and begin to teach in the middle of that week. And then finally, on the last day of the feast, go to verse 37. On the last and the greatest day of the feast, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice. So this chapter is centered around before, in the middle of, and at the end, on the last great day of the feast. Jesus is teaching, and this chapter is centered around that. And by the way, the responses... During each of these periods, during each of these periods, the responses can be characterized by three words, and here they are. Before the feast, disbelief. On the part of his own family. In the middle of the feast, debate, debate. And on the last day of the feast, division, division. That's the responses to the Lord Jesus Christ during this time. All right, um, Jesus encountered opposition from several sources. We're going to find this out as we go through. From the, in, the, the dwellers, people living in Jerusalem, from those that came from a far distance to the festival, from them too. From the Jews, the religious leaders, the scribes, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, great conflict, but also from his own family. And that's what we're going to focus on first this morning. And that is this. Before the feast, it's characterized by disbelief. Jesus encountered opposition from his unbelieving brothers. So you got your Bible there to chapter 7, verse 1. Let me just uh, read these nine verses. I'll have you remain seated. Here we go. After this, Jesus went around... In Galilee, purposely staying away from Judea because the Jews there were waiting to take his life. But when the Jewish feast of tabernacles was near, Jesus' brother said to him, You ought to leave here and go to Judea so that your disciples may see the miracles you do. No one who wants to become a public figure acts in secret. Since you are doing these things, show yourself to the world. Show yourself to the world. Now John adds this, verse 5, for even his own brothers did not believe in him. Therefore Jesus told them, the right time for me has not yet come. For you 
any time is right. Jesus was on a divine timetable. For them, any time was right. Didn't matter. Verse 7, the world cannot hate you, but it hates me. Because I testify that what it does is evil. You go to the feast. I'm not yet going up to this feast. Now, yet is questionable whether some very early manuscripts do not have the word yet. So let's read it that way. I'm not going up to this feast because for me, the right moment, the right time has not yet come. And having said this, he stayed in Galilee. They went on their way up to the Feast of Tabernacles. Now, before the feast, disbelief on the part of his unbelieving brothers. Let me first uh, ask this question. Who are these people? Who are his brothers? Now, we've got this. Unfortunately, most of us have heard of or may be influenced by, maybe not all of us, but we've heard of this thing of the perpetual virginity of Mary. As if it's something wrong to be married and to have children. Which God created the institution of marriage. Correct? Be fruitful, multiply the, and multiply. Fill the earth. Why? Why is being celibate on the part of some such a holy state? And marriage some, type, some kind of lower form. A giving in to the flesh. Why is that true? It's not true. It's a lie. By the way, how has celibacy gone for them? Talk about corruption and abuse and vile things. All throughout church history, all in these monasteries... In the Reformation, it was one of the things that was going on, the filthiness of the priests and how they lived. They had concubines, multiple concubines. How, how is celibacy gone? Not so well. Because it's a lie of the devil to besmirch the name of Christ. There's nothing wrong with marriage and having children. So who are, who are these brothers? Well, um, for various interpretations concerning their relationship to Jesus arose in the early church, and they're still with us today. One of them is that they were sons of Joseph. They were sons of Joseph by a previous marriage. That's pure speculation. But it, it protects Mary and this perpetual virginity issue. We have no evidence of that. Joseph was married to a previous marriage, and these are the... These are the brothers. Another one is that they were cousins. This is what Jerome said, the early church father, Jerome, who gave us the Latin Vulgate. But anyway, they were cousins. In other words, Mary had a sister, and um, uh, they were her sister's children. They were cousins. There's no evidence of that either. Who are these people? Well, they, these people, Mary bore other children with Joseph as their father. What's wrong with that? Nothing. Nothing at all. Jesus' brothers are actually his half-brothers. Jesus' father was not Joseph. So, you know, four brothers, and they're named. Go with me to Mark chapter 6. Mark chapter 6. Here we have uh, one of these passages. It's also in Matthew 13, the same account. Jesus left there, Mark chapter 6, and went to his hometown, accompanied by his disciples. When the Sabbath came and he began to teach in the synagogue and many who heard him were amazed. Where did this man get these things, they asked. What's this wisdom that has been given him that, even, that he even does miracles? Now remember, where is he? He's in his hometown. What is that? 
Nazareth. He was raised for 30 years in Nazareth. He's the carpenter's son. That's what the people said. And they said, well, what, what's this wisdom? That we're, they were amazed at his teaching. Isn't this the carpenter? Isn't this Mary's son? And the brother of James, Joseph, Judas, or Jude, that's another form of it, and Simon, aren't his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. Jesus said only in his hometown, among his relatives, and in his own house is a prophet without honor. We've all experienced that, haven't we? Yeah, it's often very true. But anyway, Jesus had four brothers. James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas, or Jude. And he had at least two sisters. I say two because we don't know their names, but it says the, the word sisters is plural. So he had at least two and maybe more. So these are his brothers and sisters, his half-brothers and sisters. Jesus was raised by Joseph and Mary, but um, Joseph was not his natural father. Second question, what advice did they give to Jesus? Well, their argument was that Jesus needed to be seen in the limelight of Jerusalem. They knew what he claimed. Not in the out-of-way Galilee of the Gentiles. Not here. If he seriously hoped to be accepted as the national Messiah, he needs to go and display his stuff up down there in Jerusalem. And what a perfect opportunity, the Feast of Tabernacles. And keep in mind, Jesus had not been there for some time now. But these men certainly had the world's point of view. They were speaking as the natural man without the spirit. These are lost people. Can you believe they were lost after living with Jesus for 30 years, being raised with him? Shows you how dark and depraved the human mind and heart is. But these men certainly had the world's point of view. If you want to get a following, use your opportunities to do something spectacular. Jerusalem would be crowded with pilgrims. And this would give Jesus the ideal platform to present himself and win over people. No doubt his brothers knew that the multitude of disciples, many had deserted him, John 6, 66, they knew this. This was his opportunity to recoup his losses. By the way, Satan had a similar suggestion three years before, didn't he? Jesus was tempted in the wilderness and Satan took him up to a high mountain and said, look out, see the kingdoms of this world, all of these I will give you if you would but fall down and worship me. That's what these brothers were saying. Go, prove who you are, gain a great following without what? The cross. Without the cross. Satan said the same thing. Jesus had already turned down the crowd's offer to make him king, and he was not about to yield to them either in any way. Celebrities might ride to success on the applause of the crowd, but God's servants know better. By doing miracles during the feast, at the official city, Jesus would muster a crowd, reveal himself as Messiah, and overcome the enemy. The suggestion came from hearts and minds blinded by unbelief. And also, a hiss of a serpent behind it. It was not the right time for Jesus to show himself to the world. That was to say, show yourself to the world. It was not the time. One day he will return and every eye will see him. The Lord lived on a timetable, a divine timetable, and it was not ready for him to display and manifest himself to the world. But that day is coming. That day is coming. 
The third question I just want to ask is, and I kind of already answered this one a little bit, was their advice wise? And the answer is no. As we already pointed out, it was worldly advice. And here's another side of it, though. The good news in all of this is we do know that at least two of his brothers would believe and go on to become great leaders in the church. Amen? That's right. Two of them would go on. James, James is one of them. He became the leader of the Jerusalem church, the leader, and was the author of the New Testament book of James. Also Jude or Judas got saved somewhere along the time, probably after the after the crucifixion and the resurrection of Jesus. The Bible says that Jesus appeared to James personally and specifically. 1 Corinthians 15. But Jude is usually identified as the author, New Testament book of Jude. And he says, Jude, a servant of God and brother of James. So two half-brothers of Jesus came to know the Lord. We don't know about the other two, but maybe they did too. But we don't know. But we do know James and Jude. And they gave us two books of the New Testament, which are awesome. Awesome. Well, I want to, we touched on this first nine verses. I just want to give some personal application of this passage in our lives. And the first thing I want to say is this. The right time will come for Jesus to show himself to the world. This was not the time. We know, we know from biblical prophecy what is going to take place. This is, an, this is a visual display of the book of Revelation. And we do know that before the Lord returns, before he comes again, we are now in between. We are now, as I've pointed out before, in, in the, in the inter-advent, Advent 1, Advent 2, well, Advent 2. We are between the, we are in the interregnum. The time there between the coming of the king. And when he comes, this is the day of the Lord. Beginning, beginning here and right up to, well, right from then on. It's the day of the Lord. It's, when the, it's the day that Jesus comes to win back, to take back all that Adam and Eve gave up. Gave over to Satan. He's the God of this world. But Jesus is going to restore his rule and he's going to take back the realm he created, created the first Adam who failed, but the second Adam, Jesus, is going to succeed. And he's going to bring back this earth under his control and then it's after for a thousand years he will be here ruling from Jerusalem over the, all the earth. That's always been God's plan. And the conduit of that is the Jewish people. They are his people. And by the way, until they repent, he's not coming back. Or he will come back and they will repent at that time, I should say. But when he comes, the day of the Lord is going to be characterized by two things in the Old Testament prophets. Here are they. There's going to, it's going to be preceded by a time of tremendous judgment and wrath on this planet. That's why Jesus said, I did not come to give, bring peace on this earth. Not initially anyway. But there's controversy and conflict. And the day of the Lord begins and is preceded by a time of tremendous. In the book of Revelation, it's the seals, the trumpets, the bowl judgments. And, the, and unless those days are limited, no flesh will survive. But the wrath of God against the rebellion and hatred of those who will not believe what the earth has done to his people and what the earth has done to the Messiah, to Jesus himself, all is going to be judged. The inhabitants of the earth. But then the day of the Lord is going to be followed by what? A time of blessing and Prosperity, the curse will be lifted 
for a thousand years and on this earth and then rolling over into the new heaven and new earth where there will be only believers and the new Jerusalem will come down out of heaven where heaven is today and be on the earth and God and man will dwell together and that's always been the plan from Genesis 1 and 2. Always been the plan. You definitely want to be there. Amen? And God the Father has made a way by which we can participate in this. It's through his son Jesus and without Jesus... And without his grace, there is no hope. There is no salvation. There's no forgiveness of sin. There's no one that's good. We can't do enough merit. We, can't, we don't deserve it. It's all by the grace of God in Jesus Christ, who the God-man died for your sin on the cross, paid for it in full, and you can find forgiveness of sin. You can find eternal life forever by receiving the gift. Isn't that awesome? By receiving the gift. They said, show yourself to the world. Satan said the same thing. I'll give you all of it. But that's not the way it's going to happen. Second thing I want to say by way of application, going in a different direction. Oh, Behold, he's coming with the clouds. Every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. And all the peoples of the earth will mourn because of him. So shall it be. Right? And don't, don't, don't bow to that silly notion that the church over the years has said that the book of Revelation is really a picture of the church for the past 2,000 years or the early days in its struggle with Rome. That's just nonsense. It's not about that at all. It's about the future. What's coming. And there's the theme of the book. Right there, right in the beginning. Behold, he's coming with the clouds. And every eye will see him. Even those who pierced him. And all the peoples of the earth will mourn because of him. So shall it be. And if God says that, guess what? So shall it be. Here's the second thing. In our day, there are many opinions concerning Jesus. I mean, look at, um, look at chapter 7, verse 10. However, you know, he stayed in Galilee, but at, however, after his brothers had left for the feast, he went also, not publicly, though, but in secret. Now at the feast, uh, now at the feast, the Jews were watching for him and asking, where is that man? Among the crowds, there was widespread whispering about him. Some said, he's a good man. Others replied, no, he deceives the people. But no one would say anything publicly about him for fear of the Jews. Widespread opinions about Jesus at this time as well as in our day. If you do a man on the street interview, just walk around and ask people, who's Jesus? What do you think? You'll get all kinds of opinions. But let me just say with regard to this, that is this. People's reality doesn't count. You know, I've heard a lot lately, and I really have in the last couple of weeks, I've heard this phrase, this person's reality. You know what that means? That's a postmodern term. And it means truth doesn't exist. Or if it does, if it does, somewhere in the, we can't know it. So everyone has their own truth, but they call it reality. What is your reality? And we're supposed to bow down to everyone's reality, except them bowing down to ours. Who's your reality? Or what, what's reality to you? People's reality doesn't count. Because let me tell you, there is truth. There is truth. Truth is truth. And no matter how much they try to deny it, they can't deny it. It is there. People's reality doesn't count because many, many, many are on the broad road and entering the wide gate that ends in destruction. And their reality will not matter a bit. It's only the narrow road and the narrow gate 
through which you find life, and that's Jesus. So sincerity doesn't count. Sincerity doesn't count. I think of the Apostle Paul in, I'll just read this passage in Romans chapter 10, where he said this about his own people. He said, brothers, my heart's desire, my heart and prayer to God is for the Israelites, is that they may be saved. For I can testify about them that they are zealous for God, but their zeal's not based on knowledge. You know, you can be very zealous about something, be dead wrong. Since they did not know, they did not know the righteousness that comes from God, and they sought to establish their own, they did not submit to God's righteousness. They didn't go God's way, but they were sincere and zealous for the law and for the God of their fathers in some way. Sincerity doesn't count. Here's one. Proximity to Jesus doesn't count. I mean, his brothers, they, they were raised with him for 30 years. They didn't have a relationship with Jesus as far as salvation is concerned. They didn't. And there's a lot of kids that are raised in Christian homes. And there's a lot of people that are around church. And, uh, you know, they may go because they have a great coffee time. Or they have a small group dealing with something or other. And, the, and those, I'm not against those things. The point is this. But they're going and they're in the proximity. They're in the realm. They're, they're there amongst uh, Christians to some extent. Proximity to Jesus doesn't count. He said, then what does count? What counts is faith in the person and work of Jesus, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Every human being must come to a place of deciding, understanding, have information about who Jesus is. He's the God-man. What he did on the cross. He died for my sins and rose again from the grave. And then place their faith, their trust in the Lord Jesus to save them and turn away, repent from everything else they've been thinking or looking to, that hoping that was going to get them there. Repent of all that and place their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Their trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. I just want to end with what I ended with last week, and that is this. You know, in everyone's heart, in everyone's heart in, in life, there's a knock going on. Jesus said, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, people have to open the door, right? I will come in and eat with him and he with me. Jesus will come in. And I want to end, the last slide was with what I ended, Chuck Swindoll made this statement. I think it's a very penetrating one. If you've never taken Jesus into your life, assimilated his being into yours, then he is outside of your life, even though you're in close proximity, maybe. As with a child whose nose is pressed against the bakery store window, it doesn't matter how close you are to the bread or how sweet or fresh you think its smell is, if you don't reach out and take him as the bread of life, then he's forever encased on the shelf while you're forever on the street, hungry, lost, separated from God. And it's so sad, and we, we need to make people or help do what we can. And I know God's dealing with people's lives but to come to the place where they come to receive the gift that God wants to give them. It's all paid for, amen? amen? Jesus paid for our sins at the cross. He's the Lamb of God. And he wants to forgive, and he wants to save, but he, you have to open the door to let him come in by faith. Let's pray. Our Father, I want to thank you I want to thank you for this passage of Scripture which shows us it's absolutely amazing that his own brothers, we don't know anything about his sisters, but his own brothers did not believe. They did not believe. And they gave and offered worldly advice 
which Jesus didn't accept or follow, but we're thankful that there came a time when at least two of them we know came to know you as their personal Savior and made, made a huge impact on the early church and on us today. Thank you, Lord, that you're doing this all over the place in the world. And I pray that in the hearing of my voice, there might be those who have not yet made that decision of faith, that they would do it. Whoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved. And I just ask that you would work in hearts and lives and may that happen. And if it does, may I help them to take the next steps and grow in their, in their relationship to you. We pray this now in Jesus' name. Amen. Stand again, will you please? What gift of grace is Jesus mighty?
Amen? Amen. Yet not I, but through Christ in me. Isn't that a great line? It is. His mercy is more. And that's another great statement in line. So we've had a wonderful morning. It continues in our classes. Let's do that. We'll start at 11.05 and end at 12.05 because Christopher went too long with his announcements. Let's pray. <laughs> Thank you, our Father, for a glorious morning in our service. We look forward to the smaller settings, to study, to fellowship, to pray as classes. We're thankful. In Jesus' name, amen. We're dismissed.